Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, so at Georgia Tech, I lead the Culture and Technology Lab, the CAT Lab, where we study how cultural practices with technology impact learning, and we use those understandings um, to help design learning technology and learning environments. So in, in all of our work, at some point or another, we end up using participatory design methods, and we consider it just part of our normal practice. But the focus of our work and the theories and foundations that we work from are certainly from the learning science perspective. Um, and usually my work is focused on learning sciences, not design. Um, and I often find myself actually in this role where as a learning scientist who reads a lot and works a lot in design, I'm bringing in as an advocate to the learning sciences to to look more seriously at design study in the learning sciences. And actually with Jason, and I are co-editing a book for the learning sciences on participatory design. So I'm very, that's a big part of what my practice is, but today I'm actually going to talk about it in the other direction. Um, so kind of looking casually, I had observed how the learning sciences might be influencing things happening in participatory design or how the theories could be noted in those um, effective participatory design. And so this investigation is really how learning sciences can inform participatory design practices rather than the opposite way that I usually do. So Mueller's tongue-in-cheek proposal, just add water and stir, and stir, I think really highlights the problem that we frequently find in PD. We don't exactly know how to ask users to contribute to the design process to really participate in it because they are not prepared to participate in the design process. So I wanted to better understand what factors matter in the success or failure of participatory design. Now, we often think about the goals of participatory design as a way for us to learn as designers or developers. Um, we're looking for insights or inspiration for new designs. And we get that by you know, spending time with our participants and having them do activities that really help us um, understand what their, their, their tech knowledge, the heuristics that they use in their everyday processes. So, but getting someone to identify these everyday processes, these practices that they're fluent in, to break those down and to articulate them to someone else is really difficult. And when you think about it, at least from a learning science lens, um, you can identify that as metacognition. And metacognition is thinking about how you think and being art able to articulate how you think. And generally, when we think about metacognition, we think about it from two components. First of all, knowledge about cognition, knowing what we think, and then second, regulation of cognition, knowing what strategies or heuristics we use um, to reason about a problem or a task. And this is very much what we're trying to get at when we're looking at participatory de design and understand how stakeholders deal with different issues in their lives. Like we're trying to get them to break this apart for us and really articulate what happens in their mind as well as in the world. So to better understand how metacognition might play a role in participatory design, I reviewed all 160 abstracts from Sig Chi that mentioned participatory design in the keywords. So that was a lot of papers to look at. <laughs> um, I didn't read them all, just the abstracts of those. Um, and then I went through and coded those that had a presence of different learning constructs. Um, and I identified three learning constructs that contributed to metacognition that occurred the most frequently. There was actually a number of other learning constructs that I think in future work I would explore. And those three are reflection, pre-existing knowledge, and zones of proximal development. And from there, I read the papers that I had coded for each one of these. I read the whole one, the whole paper that time. Um, and I identified the studies that I thought were the exemplars of learning theory in that they were really nice demonstrations of learning constructs that I thought would be easy to explain and also to represent a diversity of studies across domains and techniques that were used. So I'm going to speak to each of the constructs and then give examples of how we can see them enacted in participatory design activities. And the first is reflection. And reflection is a lot of what you probably think it is. It's engaging students in that metacognitive process through reflection by asking 
a learner to predict their ability to perform on various tasks or um, learners to measure their mastery at something and for learners to track what they need to learn to, to gain mastery. So while reflection certainly can be a solitary activity, learning sciences have identified that collaborative efforts are well suited to encourage reflection through articulation. And one example of reflection in participatory design is the work of Chen and colleagues investigating the analytical process of intelligence analysts. So the activity they had them participate in was a role-playing activity where they role-played um, real-world scenarios, like security threats, and on stage like acted out how they might deal with this or in a public forum. And afterwards, they had a reflective interview with them. So I think that... Um, and as I said, this encouraged and engaged users in the analysis and design of their own work. And from the lens of the learning sciences, um, the participants' public performances of their jobs actually acts like a mirror for them. So they can kind of see, they're looking a little bit from the audience perspective at what their everyday activities are. Um, and that's very much a reflective practice. And then the interviews immediately af afterwards help them capture that self-awareness um, and let them better see their own procedural knowledge and really break it down. So I think that's a nice example of reflection. In one of my previous studies, um, we were having problems getting participants to talk about technology with us. There was a real power imbalance between us and the participants. So we used a method called medium probes that required participants to answer questions about a topic they were very comfortable talking about um, every day for a week using a different medium each day, a different communication medium. And then they were asked to participate in a focus group where they compared and contrasted technology they used. So in this sense, it gave them specific instances to reflect on technology use, and it allowed us to overcome that, uh, that power imbalance that was going on. And they could recognize their own knowledge and sort of their own preferences and practices, having those specific moments to look back on. So again, this ties back into the idea of metacognition. So the second construct I want to talk about is pre-existing knowledge. And I think we all know that um, people come into new, any new situation with a whole range of prior knowledge, their skills, prior skills and goals and beliefs. And pre-existing knowledge very much interprets how people in, uh, remember, reason, or problem in any given situation. So oftentimes, one of the things we note in learning sciences is how pre-existing knowledge may be a misconception that um, even though they hold like misconceptions about the way the world works, they're able to perform their current tasks fine with that misconception, but as you ask them to push out, it's really difficult for them to form tax, new tasks because they're basing it off of you know, fundamental misconceptions. Um, I think that participatory design is a great way to elicit some of these preconceived notions, and I would say that's actually often the job that a designer is trying to get at, is trying to help find out what those preconceived notions are. Um, and by making them aware of what their preconceived notions are, you may be able to find out where those misconceptions are as well, and through design help address those. So an example of how pre-existing knowledge might play a role in the participatory design process can be found, I'm probably going to slaughter this name, I hope they're not here, um, Oganowski um, and, and colleagues' study of living lab that encourages users, um, it was a do design of a living lab that encourages users um, in the lifespan of home entertainment development process. Um, participants were originally assigned to attend workshops based on their technology experience. And so, is that you? Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Sorry, now I'm off. Oh, so they had originally tried to assign the participants to be in homogeneous groups based on their expertise with technology. So the more expert technologists were in one group and the, less, the more novice um, technologists were in another group. But because of scheduling conflicts and such, sometimes some of the novices were in groups with the experts. Um, and this actually, this imbalance actually resulted in some positive outcomes. So the authors note that especially during workshops, non-experienced users contributed many interesting and innovative ideals due to precisely to their lack of knowledge about marketable technology. And it seemed from reading the paper that it was actually sometimes these um, heterogeneous groups that were really useful where we had uh, as um, Eris and, and colleagues say, a symmetry of ignorance. 
So there was people with different kinds of ignorance who could bring that lack of preconceived notions together and help design better together. So thinking about pre-existing knowledge in several ways, I think, can apply to how we think about participatory design. And the third construct I want to talk about is zones of proximal development. And ZPD is a concept originally developed by Vygotsky, which explains the access learners have to new knowledge. Um, so in Vygotsky's model, the learner can solve certain problems unaided and yet can't solve other problems. And the zone between those two situations is the zone of proximal development. And that's where a learner can solve problems with some guidance, right? But some things are just simply outside of their reach. Um, so we, I, I see zones of proximal development actually is really critical when we're designing participatory design activities because if we have things outside of the learner's reach, um, they're not going to be able to contribute at all. If we have things that are already something that they know, they're just going to cycle around in those answers that they already know. And the example I'm going to show you kind of reinforces this. Um, so Svanis and Sleeland, um, in their study, had participants trained in dramatic techniques and then asked them to use those improv techniques to build scenarios for use in a mobile system. And what they found is that for a lot of people, even with some guidance, um, doing this dramatic techniques and creating performances was just too difficult for a lot of people. And it was really intimidating for some of the participants. So this example of too big of a leap outside of the zones of proximal development. On the other hand, they had a number of participants who were actually PhD students and researchers um, who knew a lot about the questions that they were asking. And with this group, they found the results were very repetitive in what they already knew. So, as they said, without real users, the workshop runs a danger of spinning in the air and simply iterating existing assumptions and prejudice about the context of use. So this is an example of how to not pushing participants out of their zone of proximal development by not challenging them can produce um, unproductive participatory design as well. So just in conclusion, participatory design often in, enacts activities that I actually think are exemplars of learning, and I think that all of us should use more participatory design activities in our classrooms. Um, and I, but I do also think that the learning sciences can lend something to participatory design by giving them some theories and constructs that could really help new people, new designers, to these, use these methods, giving some things to hold on to, how do I do this well, and also maybe provide some metrics for a designer to consider um, before they launch something in the field. So the next steps, this is very, very early work that I'm doing in this arena, and I think the next steps would be more extensive reviews of other um, participatory design studies, but also I'd like to start interviewing researchers. Um, I particularly want to learn about failures of participatory design, so if any of you have failures, please take down my, <laughs> my address and tell me all about them. Um, uh, and I also think there's a chance here to create some PD activities that explicitly either leverage or ignore these kind of learning constructs to see what happens and how much this holds up as, as we use it in the real world. So that's all I got. Thank you.